it's a rainy morning as we're getting ready to depart Portsmouth, but that's okay. A little rain never hurt anybody. The sea should be fairly calm as we're now boarded onto the Challenger, which is one of the tour boats that leaves out of Portsmouth and goes out to the Isles of Shoals. The Challenger is part of the Isles of Shoals Steamship Company, which we will be coming back on from Portsmouth. So we're gonna take one boat out and a different back on our voyage out. But as you can see, it is a dreary morning over our fair city of Portsmouth. Now Portsmouth in its own right is very old and very historic. Portsmouth dates from 1623 and was actually once the capital of New Hampshire for about a hundred years, right up until the time of the American Revolution. We're looking at the backs of all of these buildings here. Um, we're looking up the hill there. You can see the uh, beautiful cupola for St. John's Church. And we are down here along Bow Street. And we are also down along Siri Street. The reason why the street on the right is called Siri Street is because all of the boats that used to come in that used to carry grain for Portsmouth's breweries were thought to be blessed by the goddess Ceres, who was the goddess of the grain. So one of the things I love about Portsmouth is a lot of the street names have sort of uh, connections back to our history. And Bow Street, which is the curve of the Archer's Bow, where all of these buildings that you see here are. Now, a lot of these, of course, today are commercial buildings. Um, we have restaurants. That is the ferry landing right over there on the other side of the tugboats, where the ferry used to actually land. Now, that ferry would ferry you back and forth from Kittery over to Portsmouth. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time when there were no bridges that connected uh, Kittery to Portsmouth and you had to take the ferry across. So if you've ever eaten at the ferry landing in Portsmouth, know that that was actually where the ferry was. Now, as we continue our voyage along the beautiful Piscataqua River, you'll see all of the buildings here on the right. Again, those are along Bow Street. And Bow Street suffered a pretty catastrophic fire um, back in 1806. Portsmouth had three great fires, 1802, 1806, and 1813. And one of the ways that you can tell where all of these fires happen is these corridors are all built out of brick. So there's Bow Street right there, and then Siri Street just up ahead, um, Market Street being on the other side there. But it is rather a gloomy morning to be going out as we're getting ready to go underneath the Memorial Bridge. And off on the right, of course, you can see all of the trees for Prescott Park. And it's very interesting because sometimes when people come out on the tours, they'll ask where all of the docks and wharves are in Portsmouth. And it actually used to be right where Prescott Park is today. That entire area has changed very dramatically. Um, the old wharves were filled in and a park was established throughout the early part of the 20th century. But if you can sort of imagine back in your mind seeing you know, four and five masted schooners tucked in here and all of the commerce that you would have seen here back in the day. It was very, very industrial. And today we just quietly pass it by as a beautiful scenic area as we start to make our way out. Of course, you'll see the bridge that goes over to Pierce Island in just a moment. And then there's also Four Tree Island as well. As we start to make our way towards the mouth of the Piscataqua River, of course, we're going to go by the great island of Newcastle. Now, Newcastle used to be part of Portsmouth at one time. And one of the great things I love about being in Newcastle is you can see out to the Isles of Shoals. So this is Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse right here. And this was the first light station established north of Boston, Massachusetts. And the original lighthouse that was here dated back to 1771. It is now part of Fort Constitution, which formerly was Fort William and Mary, which is a very old fort that goes back to the 1630s. Now, if we look just past Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, you can see all of those trees back there. Again, that's the Great Island Common, and it's one of the best kept secrets. If you are longing for a view of the Isles of Shoals or you are longing to see um, the you know, sun rising or the moon rising over the Isles, uh, you have a beautiful straight view out to sea there. 
And I'm always surprised a lot of people don't know that beautiful park is there. However, you might be saying, you know, um, I don't really feel like making the ride into Portsmouth, you know, maybe Portsmouth is a, a little too busy and maybe you want to go down to Rye Harbor. There is a, another uh, way to head out to the Isles of Shoals and that is from Rye. And of course, Rye Harbor is a, a very active and very small protected harbor there, it's always full of fishing and pleasure boats and even some famous boats. So this is the, uh, the pinwheel, which you may be saying to yourself, you know, the name of that boat seems pretty familiar. And this was a boat that was on um, the show Wicked Tuna. And it is a tuna fishing boat. And um, I believe that show was on um, the Discover Channel. So here's another look at Pinwheel. So it's always kind of fun to see, you know, what you're going to pass by. But going out from Rye, uh, we would go out on the Uncle Oscar. So here is the Uncle Oscar. And you might be wondering who Oscar is. And of course, um, we'll be talking a bit about Oscar. Um, Oscar Layton is really a, just such a fascinating character. And um, we'll, we'll tell a little bit about his, uh, his story in a little while. Um, but it's really kind of cool because you have the Uncle Oscar named for Oscar Layton. And then you have the Thomas Layton named for Thomas Layton, who was the lighthouse keeper out on the Isles of Shoals as well. So of course, here is the Uncle Oscar docked out at Star Island as perhaps we decided to come in on the Uncle Oscar. As we start to make our way closer to Star Island here, notice how quick that boat ride was. Um, normally it takes about an hour to make your way um, from Portsmouth out to the Isles of Shoals. So we were just looking over towards Smutty Nose Island um, and we'll tell you a little bit about Smutty Nose um, in a little while. But it's about a, a seven mile journey to uh, make our way again along the Piscataqua across the open ocean and out here to the Isles of Shoals. Now, um, typically when you come out to the Isles, they will offer you an opportunity to, uh, you can do a walkabout, um, you know, for an hour or two, you can do a day trip. And it really is a perfect place for a day trip. I mean, the, the rocky shoreline here is absolutely amazing as we start to come up dockside. And it is um, a place where you can actually sort of get lost out here as well. And that's, I think, one of the most appealing things to me is when I think about going to a place that is like traveling back in time, indeed, that's what you have out here. Um, there's such a sense of remoteness, even though you can look out and, you know, see, uh, you know, uh, the state of New Hampshire, you can look out to Maine, and it really is just incredible. So of course, the first thing that you'll notice upon arrival here is this huge and rambling um, hotel, which is called the Oceanic. And it does look huge because the island is, you know, it's, it's fairly small in size. And this hotel was actually built during the days of tourism back in the mid 19th century. And it truly does, again, look like something that you would step off the boat back in the day. At that time, you know, in the 19th century, Star Island and even the Isles of Shoals themselves were really becoming a destination for creative people, artists, painters, um, gardeners. It was really just incredible the amount of inspiration that people were drawing from the Isles of Shoals. And even today, you'll find a lot of people will come out here to do artist retreats. There's um, all sorts of ways to get in touch with nature and certainly to get in touch with yourself as well. And again, th those are just you know, some of the, the few appealing things that you'll find um, while you're out here. The Oceanic Hotel is, is really quite, um, quite amazing in its own right and can be kind of shocking for some people. Uh, some people are surprised that there is a little to no Wi-Fi out here. There's no TVs in the rooms. There's no telephones. Um, it's, it's very, very interesting sort of uh, how people adapt when they come out here. This is not a hotel in the sense of what many people would expect to be um, a hotel. Now, um, if we go back to the summer of 1896, uh, you know, somewhere at that time, um, Thomas and Lilla Elliott had come out to the Isles of Shoals. 
And Lilla was um, very ill at the time and she wanted to spend some time at the ocean. They decided instead of going to uh, services that they typically went to out at Lake Winnipesaukee, they decided to come out to Star Island. And at that time, again, now we're very late 1800s, um, the hotels at the time weren't doing terribly well. So the Elliots decided that maybe bringing a religious conference out here to the island, maybe that might help make a difference. And maybe it might actually uh, fill, fill the entire property. Again, things started to drop off at that point. They were able to continue to bring guests out to, um, to Star Island. And they held a lot of services out here, which was, um, which was pretty amazing that this was now turning from an artist ret retreat to a spiritual retreat and got its name uh, due to the resemblance of the island looking a bit like a star. If you look from this aerial view on your lower right, you can see the Thomas Layton steamship coming into the scene here. And it is a very small island, but there is um, so much to explore and lots of different areas, which we'll, we'll take a look at where it is just, you know, kind of wild and rugged out there. Now the Isles of Shoals, if you're wondering, um, you know, sort of what the, the quick history on that is, um, the Isles of Shoals is this, you know, amazing group of islands, half are in New Hampshire, half are in Maine. Um, they originally were called Smith's Isles because of Captain John Smith, which we'll go out and take a look at his monument there. And they were renamed the Isles of Shoals due to their resemblance to a school of fish. So here we are looking across Star Island over there to White Island, um, which we'll get a closer look at in a little while once we, start once we start walking around. As we started to move into the early 20th century, um, the island actually went up for sale at one point. And the island, Star Island was purchased um, again for these spiritual conferences. And eventually an organization called the Star Island Corporation was formed. And they still are, you know, pretty much uh, in charge of what happens out here, particularly in season. So let's uh, continue our voyage as we get ready to step off of the boat. We can see we're stepping upon the weather docks here. And as we make our way up, you can see there is a sign that tells us that there are no dogs allowed on the island. The tide is coming up. So if you're wondering what sort of tide we're looking at right here, um, it was about an hour to a uh, high tide here as we make our way off of the Challenger. Walking up the gangplank, we're looking across, of course, at um, Appledore Island as well, um, off in the distance there, and Smutty Nose Island, as I mentioned, we just passed. So here is a look at the Challenger. That's what we came out on from Portsmouth. We'll take a look at the stern of the Challenger here from the docks. And of course, you can see these massive tie ups here. And as we turn around, a lot of people are very surprised to see that it actually is part of the Rye, New Hampshire Historic District. And uh, if you uh, happen to come out here, you are indeed in, uh, in Rye, New Hampshire. And there is a lot of work and a lot of people that is required to make everything run smoothly out here on Star Island. There are um, constantly looking for ways to make things more efficient, to really connect with um, you know, being good stewards of the land, which we'll talk about some of that as we wander around as well. Um, you know, uh, in a good year, you will see that there are about um, 200 conferences here on the island. And we'll take a look here at the sign right here on the dock. And of course, you'll see that all of these people coming out to the conferences are going to need a place to stay. And they're going to need food to eat. So there are um, currently about uh, eight year round staff out here, uh, at least 100 people, um, Pelicans included on the summer staff. Uh, of course, you've got over 500 volunteers in a good year who come out to really help 
clean up, um, open up things, uh, you know, get things winterized when uh, the island closes in October and of course in the spring, getting everything ready. It really is um, just quite the well-oiled machine out there. So let's uh, continue our look around and um, let me come back here for a second. So here you can see again, the tide line coming up. Uh, it's gonna be high tide in just about an hour. And watching that tide come in can be very, very mesmerizing. Just watching the, the seaweed just sort of flow with the tide. I always, in the, the back of my mind, picture you know the seaweed like uh, mermaid hair. And uh, I'm very easily sort of led down that, uh, down that path of, of folklore and history. It definitely does not take much for me, uh, just even just staring into the seaweed to see what we're gonna find. Of course, there's all sorts of interesting things that wash ashore um, or get caught in the seaweed. Uh, you'll see all sorts of fascinating items all over the island. Um, here you can see these two old lobster traps uh, along the walkway here that just washed up. And it's always kind of fun just to go exploring and seeing what you can find. The driftwood out here is also really amazing. Um, you'll see some amazing pieces that look like they might have come from boats. You'll see huge tree stumps. Again, there's just so much to, uh, to discover as you're wandering around. Of course, uh, the flora and fauna, the, the nature and the wildlife out here is also quite special as well. So here we're taking a look, our first look up at the Oceanic Hotel and all the cottages there. And we've passed a, a lot of interesting seabirds along the way, which you might catch a glimpse of. But my favorite birds to see out here are the swallows. Um, not only because the swallows love to eat the mosquitoes, but they are um, just such a beautiful little bird um, to watch out here is that massive front porch right there. We'll take a closer look at that in a little while, but it's the perfect place to pull up a rocking chair. Um, you know, people will bring books or uh, musical instruments. And sometimes you can just hear music wafting from the porch up there, laughter. It's just such a very special place. You'll also notice again that there is so much wildlife out here. You get a lot of monarch butterflies. This is the time of year that they're out on the island sort of doing their butterfly thing. There are lots and lots of uh, wild milkweed out here. So of course, that is the choice for a lot of the butterflies out there. They just love it. As soon as we come um, onto the island, there is a burial ground that is here. And it is really amazing to ponder how many people have been buried out here um, on Star Island? Now they no longer allow burials out here. Um, it is, you know, it is something that is from from the past. It fascinates me, though, in um, in many ways that you know what a beautiful beautiful place um, to sort of uh, spend all eternity in. So let's take a closer look at this beautiful burial ground. This is the Caswell Cemetery here. So we'll start to make our way over. And of course you can see we're right at the edge of the Oceanic Hotel. Beautiful stone wall all around the gravestones here. Now my understanding was when I first started researching this burial ground years ago, that there are more people that are buried here than there are grave markers for. Now, some of the stories behind that relate to the fact that not everybody got a gravestone, that people may have been buried with simple stone markers or field stones as it were, which you can sort of see a little bit of that. There's a few field stones that are sticking out here, which would denote someone that's buried there. And, um, you know, sometimes people couldn't afford gravestones. Um, you know, gravestones were uh, very sometimes uh, difficult for people to afford back in the day. And you usually had to pay, um, you know, by the, uh, by the letter as it were. So let's take a look at some of the stones that are here. All right, so in recent years, I have noticed this new sign at the edge 
of the Caswell Cemetery here. Um, and I call it a sign, but it's technically a, a stone marker here. So um, as I was mentioning, you always want to be careful where you're walking. Of course, this is a, uh, a rainy visit to the burial ground here. So it is a little bit soft, but let's take a look at some of the gravestones here. So here we can see a beautiful slate gravestone. And when we look at these gravestones, they really tell us so much. And you'll notice that there is this beautiful weeping willow that is on the stone. And of course, here you can see a gravestone that is uh, practically tipped all the way over. And this, of course, is for Eliza G. And she was the wife of William Randall. So if we look down by our feet here, we will see the gravestone for Louisa Caswell. Um, again, with that willow motif, you'll notice this one actually has an urn underneath it. And of course the urn is also symbolic of the soul of the everlasting life. And when we read, and again, it's unfortunate there's so many lichens on here, but when we read and discover that she was just 13 years old um, when she passed, it's quite sad. And I did transcribe um, part of the epitaph here. And it says, this lovely bud, so young and fair, called home by early doom, just came to see how sweet a flower in paradise would bloom. Um, just a heart heartbreaking um, epitaph on this stone. Of course, we can see, again, some of these stones are in such bad shape that they're just flaking off and, you know, being exposed to wind, weather, and, um, you know, certainly winter time, uh, you can see that they're really not um, suited for all of that exposure. And we know that this is the grave of uh, JC. And there's not a lot to read on there, but we can, um, we can tell part of the verse is the poor have lost a friend. Um, and there's also a footstone that's here that also says JC, which seems to be going with the headstone. So if you know, you know anything about headstones and footstones, the headstones are where the, the head of the remains are, the footstone is where the foot of the remains are. So it's like they're lying in their bed, taking the long sleep. This is probably one of my favorite stones here um, and I think it's it's probably just because of um, the just the beautiful carving on here um, of that rose and this is for Lydia Stevens and she was also you know again if we look at it she was fairly young you know 25 years and uh, six months when she passed away in uh, May of 1850 and um, she was a wife at that time and uh, the wife to Moses Stevens and you'll notice that even the inscription tells us, you know, 25 years and six months. And that is really designed to remind you that we're not guaranteed any, any extra time on this world to really honor uh, every moment that you are here. And you'll notice that the rose, which is almost fully bloomed, which represents Lydia, is broken, um, you know, from, from the leaf and the carving to represent, you know, the life gone. So this is for Joseph. He was actually 62 when he passed away. And um, that to me is a, is a pretty good long life, uh, you know, for, for the time frame uh, when he uh, passed away in 1862. So he was born in, um, born in 1800. So we also have Sally Berry Caswell, who is buried in the same row. Believe it or not, her legacy was making Apple turnovers. Now that to me is a, a fantastic um, legacy. And of course the, uh, the children on the island were always after her apple turnovers and she pretty much had to hide them. And she was known for being really stern um, as they you know, were cooling, the kids were trying to uh, get them off of the, um, the uh, windowsill all the time. Um, in 1866, there was a, um, an awful fire and it took the Atlantic House and many others. And again, I'll show you um, about where that was at the time. And she lost almost everything that she owned, um, her and her husband in that fire. 
Um, but luckily uh, she survived. So again, you know, sort of imagine, you know, the, the time frame of the 19th century being out on an island and a structure burning, you know, there was no, no real fire department out here. And, you know, to escape with your life was a, a pretty miraculous thing in its own right. So I always, you know, I sort of, when I walk over people's graves, I always try to imagine, you know, what this looked like or what they experienced um, while they were alive out here. So we'll take a look at uh, sort of uh, the grave here for John Caswell. A lot of the inscription is still readable on his stone, which is just fantastic. So here we are at the entrance. We're looking out now towards White Island. You can see a lot of the, the little birds that I was mentioning just flying around us while we were here. So here's a uh, bull thistle bush. You definitely want to avoid that as you're uh, walking from the Caswell Cemetery around. Of course, there is the gazebo that is called the Summer House. There actually used to be a house right up here. And this is um, one of my favorite places to be at around sunset, which we'll, um, we'll take a look at sunset a little bit later. Um, beautiful sunset uh, from this vantage point. So as we start to make our way around, so here you can see right in the center, we are looking directly to the summer house. To the right of that is the Caswell Cemetery. And again, just this beautiful rock bound uh, edge to the island. And if you notice to the left, that gorgeous blue, and it's all sandy right there. As we turn around and start to make our way behind the Oceanic Hotel, we'll take a closer look at in a little while, we can see that there are many gardens and many garden boxes throughout the area. And that's one of my other favorite things is besides the efforts towards sustainability on the island, they do have this sort of farm to kitchen sensibility out there where the meals that you have, you know, that a lot of the vegetables and the herbs and the foods that you're eating were actually grown right here on Star Island. Um, I remember having many meals with even edible flowers from the gardens. You know, it's just really incredible to look outside and again see all of these efforts and to be eating directly off the land, I think is just um, so incredibly, incredibly special. So as you wander around, you'll see these, you know, little pockets of uh, gardens, again, that they use for. Um, for all of, all of the food here. You can see a uh, Gosport church and we'll pop inside in just a moment. And uh, this church serves as a, um, a chapel and a meeting house as well. And for many years, uh, there is a, uh, has been a processional going up the hill here and people will be carrying lanterns and just such a magical, you know, again, um, timeless moment to experience of you know people carrying these lanterns up, keeping the tradition alive from back in the day when um, people used to carry whale oil lamps up these very same paths. And you know, considering that would have been the only source for light back in its day. So here you can see we're coming up around it as we peer through the, the bushes and all of the beach roses here. So we're taking the path again right behind um, the Oceanic. So the Atlantic House would have been sort of down here to our right as we come up these paths. One of the other nice things you'll notice as we make our way around the island are all of these benches. They are everywhere in little nooks and crannies, um, behind bushes, behind gardens and buildings. And it's just such a wonderful place prompting you to sit down and stay and experience and, and see it from all of these different viewpoints. It's really um, just amazing. So let's take a, a look around here from the, the walkway. So of course there is Bossport Church up there. And that is the highest point 
um, on Star Island. So it's just the, the perfect spot to get a view of everything. So here's one of the other little sitting areas as you come up and then you'll see uh, right above the rocks, there is another. So here we are going up towards the church. So there's a, another little sitting area going up this little hill. So can you imagine the lantern processional back in its day and then all of the light that you would see from inside the church was again, all of these lamps that people were carrying. It really does just bring me back in time. So here we are with the church behind us. We're looking across, of course, way off in the distance. You can look out towards um, you know, Portsmouth and Rye and Newcastle all along Ocean Boulevard to the left again, here we are behind the hotel. So it's always just such a peaceful spot to walk up to. And as we walk to the door to open it, we're going to click this latch, you know, the old hook latches, you know, here we have, you know, all this history right here at our fingertips. And when we go inside, one of the things immediately that we see is this beautiful old sign that tells us a little bit of a fascinating story. So the Gosport Church originally constructed of the timbers from the wreck of a Spanish ship, AD 1685, was rebuilt in 1720 and burned by the islanders in 1790. The building of this stone was erected AD 1800. So here we have, can you imagine a church being built, of course, from the remnants of shipwreck? Now, there are so many stories, and I will be sharing some of those with you about the shipwrecks out on the Isles of Shoals and Star Island as well right behind us towards the altar of the church. And um, this is definitely a, a destination for a lot of people to take a moment. Um, and it's, you know, in this very rustic space um, to have a, you know, a religious or spiritual moment here. It's very, very quiet, very beautiful. And uh, it was written about quite a lot um, back in its day. And, uh, you know, lots of articles you'll find in uh, old newspapers from the 19th century, um, you know, talking about the history of it. And it's just, um, just so amazing. It's such a, a unique situation. The chapel that I had mentioned um, that originally was here um, in 1720 actually burned in 1790. And it was uh, replaced in, um, in 1802 as things uh, changed with uh, you know the religions on the island it was uh, sort of uh, left to its own devices in the late 1800s and was restored in 1897 when they started having the conferences on the islands so um, it's just amazing to think of you know all of the history here um, over the years sort of held within these walls love the uh the old brick floor and if we walk up to the altar one of the things that you'll notice are all of these seashells and you know um rocks that have been collected on the island uh you know sort of in in my mind i always wonder if uh, people are leaving those in, um, you know, in prayer, um, you know, in having a, a sacred moment out there. Um, I just, I, I really just find this just such a, a nice um, sort of tribute, a nice, um, nice place to, to be and look out every window and see a different view. Um, every window to me here is like looking out into a painting. 
So here you can see the ocean from, from all views, which is just uh, so incredible. Here's uh, another view so you can sort of see down the path here, sort of where we had come up. So as we step out of the church here, we're stepping into um, Gosport Village as it's been um, recreated over the years, these um, beautiful stone houses. Again, that really, you know, you can't tell um, a time frame as you look at these buildings. There's really not much to, to let you know that you're in the, the 21st uh, century here. One of the other beautiful things that we see as we walk around are all of these lovely gardens. Um, the hollyhocks here are just uh, fantastic as they're in bloom. Again, you never know what you're going to find at your feet. You know, this is a, a little succulent garden. It's on a rock, on a rock, on top of a rock. Um, you just, you never know what you're going to, uh, to discover. Uh, a lot of people have likened uh, this area to uh, sort of reminiscent of Anne of Green Gables, as it were. So there is also um, poisonous plants that are on the island as well. There's poison ivy that's out there. Um, there's uh, belladonna that you'll see out there quite a bit. And um, I'm not sure what this little sign is. Um, it says certain death. So my only assumption is that there is some poisonous plant um, growing uh, underneath this, as it were. Beautiful, beautiful um, cottages here. This great uh, cauldron that is here amongst the gardens, just so beautiful. And as we start to look around here, you can see the Vaughn Cottage and that serves as a small library, um, a museum and also archives uh, for the island. It's open a limited amount of hours in the summer to uh, sort of go in and uh, see some of the historic artifacts and some of the interpretive history of Star Island and, and the Isles of Shoals. This is a little private cottage here. And again, just beautifully timeless these lovely garden, can't help but admire um, the beautiful flowers that are here. Again, more of those beautiful hollyhocks there. So looking back, once again, you can see the church as we wander through the village area. And as I mentioned, chairs everywhere. Now, just beyond here, it's a whole different feel for the island. There are many, many walking paths over here. Um, lots of natural areas. We're gonna come upon uh, one of the areas where they have all of the solar panels. Again, um, they really try to be very resourceful and very forward thinking and very conservative out here um, with their resources. Of course, there's another burial ground out here. And we'll take a look at um, some of the monuments. The one that you're seeing sticking up right there is the um, Tuck Monument, which is a very large uh, granite obelisk that was um, built to honor um, the minister, Reverend John Tuck, who served out on um, Star Island. But in order to get to here, we need to pass through this uh, wooden turnstile. Now, technically, you could go around um, the stone wall here, but it's, it's more fun to, uh, to walk through the turnstile. Um, again, you're sort of imagining you're walking through a portal in time. So these are the paths and it's really important when you're out here to make sure that you stay on the path. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of poison ivy out here and a lot of uh, prickly rose bushes as well. So um, if you are wandering through the bushes, you want to make sure that you have long pants on um, and you know, really good rugged shoes uh, because these paths can be a little bit tricky um, as you try to navigate them, but it is totally worth the walk out here um, as we make our way again to the, the Tuck Monument here. You see there's a grave just below it here. So in memory of uh, 
Edward Tuck. You can see part of the story and it really is um, massive. You can see it from uh, most anywhere on the island. So as we start to make our way um, over to this little walkway, which actually is uh, kind of fairly new out here. Um, the first time I went out to uh, Star Island, uh, this little walkway was uh, not here um, because they hadn't had the, uh, the solar panels up there. But um, it's just uh, amazing that this you know, sort of tower is above everything. So technically I like it because it's sort of uh, something you keep your eyes on that you're not gonna get lost. Uh, if you know where the monument is, um, you can find your way around. At one time, there used to be animals out here. There were um, sheep and other animals to sort of keep the vegetation down. Um, there were pigs and, and whatnot. So you can sort of imagine back in the day, you know, all of the farm animals, keeping this uh, trimmed and tidy and keeping everything back um, so it wasn't uh, so difficult to navigate. Again, um, things have changed uh, so much um, over the years. In fact, there used to be a, um, a pigeon loft out uh, in the hotel. And the pigeons would, um, you know, uh, sort of make their way uh, around the island and they were carrier pigeons. So, you know, that truly was a thing. You know, I think sometimes we think that carrier pigeons were a myth, but can you imagine them, you know, flying out uh, over the island here as well. We're starting to make our way down the very, very muddy path here um, as the rain is finally coming to a close so we can uh, wander about. You can see all of those thorny bushes there, but we are coming up to the solar array, which is completely fascinating. And here we can see the sign that tells us, you know, it was completed in November, 2014. And um, you know they're doing their best to go green out here. So here you can see all of these fantastic solar panels. Again, we can see the church in the distance and the Tuck Monument right here. And um, again, lots of innovation happening out here to be sustainable and have a very green uh, footprint. And their efforts are constantly ongoing. They're always looking for um, ways to be more efficient. And we're looking off in the distance as we start to make our way down this very narrow path here. You'll see there will be a couple of Karens off in the distance is White Island Lighthouse, which we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes because you can't be on Star Island without wondering about uh, White Island Lighthouse. It's just a fantastic location. So we're gonna make our way down this narrow little path. Now you might not even realize that we are coming up on a very storied cemetery here. And when I first went out to Star Island, I was told that the cemetery was completely overgrown for a number of years. In fact, um, they wondered if it had been completely lost and it took quite some time to clean out the area to approach this cemetery. So here we're gonna head down the path in just a second. But when you start to walk down here, um, you know that there is some special story happening right here. So you wouldn't even really know that this was here. You can hear all the birds chirping as we come down the stairs here. And this is a small family cemetery. Um, and this has three graves that you can see on the right. And those are the graves for the Beebe children. Um, Reverend George Beebe actually moved his family to Star Island in 1857 so he could minister to the people that were here. Um, and he also actually served as a local doctor as well until um, about 1869. However, in 1863, um, Reverend Beebe's son, Mitty, um, it was very sad he contracted an infectious disease from the school on the mainland. So he was going to, to school on the mainland. And then his two sisters also fell ill. And the three of them died within weeks of one another. So here we can see the tall monument there. And we'll go down and take a closer look. And you can see, you know, this, this beautiful marble stone sort of lost its luster over the years but you can still read um, some of the inscriptions on this obelisk. So you'll read that Mitty died June 23rd, 1863 at the age of seven. And 
his his quote says, I don't want to die, but I'll do just as Jesus wants me to. Then his sister Millie's inscription reads, die June 12, 1863, aged four years. Dying, she kneeled down and prayed, please Jesus, take me up to the lighted place. And he did. And then the inscription for little Jesse BB is it's hard to decipher, but her name and her age, she was two, and her death date of May 30th, 1863 are very clear. So sadly, the Reverend moved off to Littleton, New Hampshire in 1867 after burying his children on Star Island. And the four surviving children who lived on the island sold their land to, uh, to John Poor, who again eventually established um, the hotel that was there. And um, the three small headstones that we were just looking at are sort of off to the side here. There used to be a beautiful um, white fence and gate surrounding uh, this entire burial ground, but it just basically became so overrun with um, ivy and brambles that the whole gate and fence broke apart. And then for years, it was so grown in, you couldn't even see it. So lucky for us today, you know, it's all been cleared away. And it is definitely a, an effort. You have to sort of climb down in here to keep the area clear and accessible. But it is a place of um, just tremendous sadness. Now, there are um, a couple of other people that are buried uh, in this area that also had connections to Star Island. But um, this is just one of those stories that uh, just really sort of speaks to me. So again, you can see the path that had to be cleared to come out here. And then again, if we sort of even um, go back at one time, again, imagine, you know, that were, there were sheep that were out here that were, you know, sort of the, uh, the lawn mowers at that time. So when this was established as a burial ground, it wasn't as overrun as it had become um, many years later. So naturally, one of the names that you'll find associated with Star Island is that of Captain John Smith. And this is the Captain John Smith Monument. And oftentimes, unfortunately, you can see his, uh, his monument is quite the uh, perch for the numerous seagulls that are out um, on the aisles. But you can, you know, again, sort of just imagine, you know, Captain John Smith uh, charting these islands back in the day. And um, the, one of the earliest maps of the seacoast was uh, drawn by him and also a man named Martin Pring as they tried to sort of, uh, you know, chart the islands and, uh, you know, the entire coastal area. So it's pretty amazing to stand here um, in that shadow of history. So here's what it looked like at one time. This is an old uh, postcard view of the Smith Monuments you can see. Um, we're back in the New England Curiosities time machine, um, as it were. And I'm um, just really amazing to, uh, to be standing here and uh, imagining you know, the story of Captain John Smith. So this is a stereo view photo um, I have in my collection. I also have a couple of postcards as well. And this is an area in the rocks that is known as Betty Moody's Cave out here on Star Island. And this is said to be another haunted area on Star. And whenever I tell this story, I always um, sort of leave it up to the listener to decide um, because it is, um, it's such a, a dramatic, such a dramatic story. Um, but so you can see the, uh, you know, the, um, dip or the cleft in the rocks there. And during 1724, uh, there was a, um, a, a skirmish, or if, if you would call it a war, it was called Lovewell's War. And she decided that she was going to Betty Moody, um, hide her children um, in this cave that's down there. So you can see the opening of the cave. And there's a couple of versions of the story. Um, one of the versions is that she accidentally um, smothered her children to death. Um, and one of the other versions of the story is um, that she did it on purpose. Again, um, I'll leave that for, 
for you to decide. Um, but this story has been um, out on the Isles of Shoals for quite some time. And uh, there's also part of this story that, you know, even today, you can see this figure sitting on the rock. It's supposed to be, you know, the ghost of Betty Moody. And that you can hear children crying from the cave. Again, um, I was told this when I was out on the island. So I'm always looking for antiques and artifacts, which I'll, I'll share a couple more with you a little bit later. Um, I personally haven't seen or heard anything by Betty Moody's cave, but I am very intrigued to imagine, you know, to sense a threat of attack um, out on the island. I mean, how perilous that feeling must have been and then to to hide in this um you know in this little cave here is um really just incredible so as we look towards white island of course you can see the day has improved quite considerably um maybe it's because we've now come out of the cave and um white island is home to white island lighthouse the lighthouse is currently owned by the state of new hampshire and if you're coming up um, from Massachusetts, uh, you can actually see Cape Ann from here in the very far distance. If you're coming up from uh, Massachusetts and you're trying to navigate your way along the New Hampshire coast, the first New Hampshire lighthouse you'll see is White Island Lighthouse. And um, this lighthouse has so many ghost stories associated with it. Um, one goes back to the rumors that the infamous pirate Blackbeard was out on the Isles of Shoals and allegedly he buried a treasure out here and he left a woman uh, to guard that treasure, even if it was till doomsday should he return. It said that she's still standing on an outcropping of rock saying he will return, he will return. Um, a few years ago, the Discover Channel actually came out to Star Island and um, started to explore the area looking for this alleged treasure and they said that they had actually found some items that may relate to the story and apparently at that point um the discovery channel was sent away um there are people that did not want them out on the isles of shoals doing the treasure hunting because they were afraid that other people would come um there's a great book and i'll make sure that it's on your list uh that you'll get a little bit later um, and it's uh, called Under the Isles of Shoals, and it talks about things that have been discovered over the years, um, you know, sort of, uh, all, you know, all uh, along the shores of particularly Star Island as well. So White Island Lighthouse, back during the blizzard of 78, was a little bit of a perilous uh, place to be. And this story was handed down from one of the Coast Guardsmen who was out there during the blizzard of 78. And just to give you an idea and to put it in contrast, over at Boone Island Lighthouse, which is off the coast of York, Maine, the blizzard was so bad that it washed every building off of the island out there. It was um, pretty bad. So imagine now being out here on White Island. So this Coast Guardsman said that he was walking along the walkway here and he was praying as he heard the roaring sounds of the ocean waves crashing around him, rocks being thrown up. And he said, once he started to pray, this mysterious woman in white appeared before him. He didn't know where she came from. All he wanted to know was, was he going to be okay? And he said that she reassured him, told him everything was going to be fine. He said he felt a sense of calm come over him. And again, while the storm destroyed almost everything on Boone Island, there was only only minor damage out here um, on White Island, and he attributed it to this mysterious woman in white. So the uh, first lighthouse was built out here in 1821. The current lighthouse that you see was built in 1865. So here's a view um, from the uh, Star Island side. You can see um, this amazing tall ship here. And this tall ship is uh, known to us here on the seacoast. It would often come up for our tall ship festivals. And it was just um, leaving Star Island. The uh, crew of this ship had actually paid for their couple of nights that they stayed on Star Island by painting the Gosport Church. That was a church that we just walked through. And, um, you know, I sort of love that fact that, you know, it, it's done the old school way. You put in a little bit of labor and you get to stay overnight. 
So this tall ship was on its way to Cape Ann and actually passed right in front of me um, as I was going out to Star Island. And very, very sadly, um, this beautiful tall ship soon thereafter sailed into the heart of Hurricane Sandy and unfortunately um, did not survive. So this is the HMS Bounty. This was the uh, replica ship that was built for the 1962 film, The Mutiny on the Bounty. And uh, there's a great book that is um, written about the account called um, Rescue of the Bounty. So here we are looking um, out as evening starts to fall on our first day on Star Island. So as evening starts to fall, we're um, going to make our way around uh, the island a little bit. We're going to go and find the uh, best spot to see a, um, a sunset. But if you sort of imagine this little area was the perfect place for um, sailing regattas um, back in the day, you can imagine this little area being full of um, ship sails. And it really sort of took hold back in the 1870s. And people used to uh, come out there uh, all the time and there, there was a, I don't know, a little bit of, um, of debate that uh, sometimes there were too many people that had come out to the island and were you know, causing such an uproar that uh, people would sometimes leave Star Island and head over to, uh, to Appledore for the silence. So here we can uh, look from this little gazebo up the path, of course, to the Oceanic and all of the rocking chairs, which one would you pick as the sun starts to fall low in the sky? And again, you can see the summer house gazebo over there. And there is nothing more amazing than seeing the sunset on um, Star Island in the summer. Um, as that sky turns red and the sun sets over the land, you can feel that cool breeze come up from the water, cooling the heat of the day, orange light creeping across the porch of the Oceanic Hotel. You can hear the, the crickets, the water lapping, and then the sun is down and the sky just turns all of these beautiful shades of crimson and orange. And the waters are all these deep shades of silvery blue as we look out from the rocks of Star Island. And the last lingering light of the day and night falls, the full moon above the Oceanic Hotel. So this is a point where you might hear music trickling down the hill. Maybe someone's playing a piano, someone's singing, um, someone's playing guitar, but we'll uh, take a look at what's happening the next day here. So this is um, part of the heritage dates that they have out um, on the island. So now that we've had a good night's rest, why don't we get up and see if we can catch the sunrise. So you're gonna have to decide what you like better, the sunset or the sunrise um, over Star Island. It is um, amazing to go out there and see it coming up over the ocean. You can see there's a few other people that are joining us as we watch the sun just come up um, so beautifully over the rocks. This is probably my favorite picture that I've taken of the sunrise from Star Island. Um, again, just so beautiful and so timeless. As we see the sunrise from the side of the art barn out there, which we'll take a look at. And that beautiful red that we saw from the sunset, we now see with the sunrise over a beautifully calm ocean in the summer. You can see the buildings lighting up behind us with that warm sunlight, all the pathways through the beach roses. 
still waters and the pond on the island. You'll often find a lot of people around this pond um, painting or doing arts and crafts as we look back at all of the buildings. A couple of beautiful painted rocks here at the art barn, which is a great little place to grab some art supplies. And here as we head into Gosport Village and all of these stone houses, you can see the sun coming up again, warming things up for the day. You can sort of imagine the heat of the day is gonna be coming in in a couple of hours. So this is the perfect time to wander around and take a look for that beautiful warm light on these stone houses. I mean, who, who really wants to go back to the mainland after this? This is, this is the, the place to, to stay out here. Now, some of these buildings were actually built a little more recently. In, uh, in 1998, there was uh, the Marshman House, which was uh, built out here. And these were all um, places to, uh, to gather. So uh, in uh, 1920, 1948, um, all these houses were slowly established out here. So there is, again, the wooden turnstile going out to the Tuck Monument. You can see a uh, replica wigwam being built out there as well. And these beautiful little houses. And again, they were, a lot of them were um, built many years apart if they all look like they're from the same timeless time frame. And again, as we look up to the church here, now there are these um, cottages that are here um, on the islands and um, they really do, again, sort of bring you back in time. Some, um, one of the, the buildings actually had a, uh, a gas plant in it that was used um, by the, the hotel. Um, some of these buildings are now used as dorms for the pelicans or the people that come as um, seasonal workers out there. Now, it was a few years ago, it was on the History Channel, uh, paranormal investigators came out to check out cottage number 13, which is just uh, off in the distance here. The belief was that cottage number 13 was haunted, that there was a person that was often seen from the windows or walking past the building when there shouldn't have been anybody there. So as we start to make our way along the walkway here, again, in the light of morning, this is the dining room and the food here is really amazing. Um, food is served community style and there's nothing like hearing someone ringing the food bell, which is an actual bell, to call everybody to eat. And um, what's really nice is you get to meet all sorts of people um, from all over to find out you know, what has brought them to the island if they're here on retreat, um, you know, what, is the, uh, what is the connection to uh, Star Island that people have. And you really get to chat with, um, with a lot of people. And again, you eat from the gardens. And again, there's so many different types of events happening. A lot of people like to come out and do personal retreats as well. Um, I remember when I was out there, uh, I found a lot of people were doing just, just artist retreats, um, just coming out to sort of get away from it all. And um, what's really cool is that people, again, the pelicans that are here, um, they really have to sort of be a jack of all trades to uh, <coughs> be out here on the island to do a little bit of everything, you know, um, from working with the visitors that are here to doing repairs, um, and they and they do love to uh, they love to have fun out here. That's one thing that uh, I totally had um, had discovered when I was here. They really enjoy themselves. So one of the fascinating um, bits of history that I discovered was in this um, photo album that I actually purchased um, in uh, Massachusetts a few years ago. And I collect photo albums. And when I opened up this album, I was very, very surprised that it had a lot of photos from the 1800s from two islands. One island is Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine. And the other island 
was Star Island. So these are original photos in my personal collection of people being out um, on the Isles of Shoals and being out on Star Island. But what really excited me was pictures of Celia Thaxter's um, cottage and gardens out on Appledore Island, which was again, uh, you know, such a, an amazing artist retreat, um, authors retreat, again, sort of the, the literary giants of the day. And, um, you know, it is uh, just so amazing to imagine, you know, all of those people going out uh, to the Isles of Shoals. So here's a view of um, the Caswell Cemetery again, here we are in, in the daylight. We've stepped back um, to our room here. And uh, wherever you go on the island, you can find um, sea glass and sea pottery. So here we are um, again facing over to Appledore and um, also um, over to Smutty Nose. So here are some of the things that I've collected on our journey around the island. And just to imagine, you know, these were all um, little bits and little shards that have been sort of thrown in the water um, over the years and have washed ashore and been tumbled by many a tide. So here we can see our view across on this bright, beautiful morning. So there is a piece of bonfire glass. Uh, bonfire glass is so named because this is glass that was burned in a bonfire. Um, who knows uh, from when this came, but you can tell that it's an old brown bottle there that we found wandering around along the shore. Here you can see pieces of old dishware and old pottery, some old bricks. You'll notice some of the old pipes there. See those uh, pieces in the middle, those long tubular pieces. Um, those amazing old clay pipes that people would smoke and they'd bite off the end and then throw that end into the ocean. So, you know, those we know go back to um, 1800s and who knows what else is out there tumbling along. Just, I love those beautiful printed pieces of pottery. You know, who ate off of those dishes back in its day? Here's a uh, little sea glass and um, porcelain, uh, I guess, mandala that somebody made out there um, on the island, which is um, pretty interesting to uh, just imagine, you know, uh, somebody else found sea glass and decided to do something very artistic with it. Again, you never know what you're going to uh, discover while you're out here. So here we are um, looking across at uh, some of the cottages you can see the windows are wide open um, and these curtains blowing in the breeze. You know, again, if you are uh, one of those folks that is a, a believer in ghosts and you see these open windows and these curtains blowing in the breeze, it only conjures up, you know, it's tales of ghosts and spirits from uh, back in the day. And everybody seemed to, uh, to have them out here. It was really um, just quite amazing. You know, some of these buildings as, you know, as the years roll on, they need constant, um, upkeep and you know picture our winters how difficult they can be um, on you know on all of these buildings out here so they have you know little buildings that are carpenter shops out here um, there is some equipment but there are no um, there aren't really a lot of vehicles out here there's a couple of vehicles that are just used to uh, you know carry uh, things from place to place whether it's um, luggage or water tanks or supplies but um, these buildings really do take a, a beating out here, particularly during the winter. Lots of stories about severe storms and um, hurricanes, uh, you know, upending some of the walkways and blowing out a window here or there. So um, just sort of imagining, you know, what it would be like uh, during storm. So during one of my visits, I was told about a haunted section of the Oceanic Hotel that was on the upper floor that was called Ghost Alley. And they actually allowed me to go up in this section, which is a area that is used um, for the Pelicans to stay. So these are more dorms here. And again, it's the upper floor of the hotel. And of course I knew I found the right place because the 
door actually says Ghost Alley. And there's a little sticker on there that says, open your eyes. Um, people were constantly seeing strange things in this hallway. Everything from seeing orbs with your bare eyes, um, guests downstairs in the lower room saying that they were hearing calliope music playing and there was nobody playing a calliope because there is no calliope up here. Um, hearing lots of noises um, up in Ghost Alley as well. They now sell t-shirts that say Ghost Alley, Star Island, guaranteed haunted. That's how many ghost stories um, come from this particular part of the hotel. So here's um, another look um, as we come back out. So you can see from this side um, that ghost alley section is up in the very top, that, that last uh, upper floor there. And a totally frameable view of the Caswell Cemetery on a clear day looking over to White Island Lighthouse as we start to make our way up to this incredible view from the summer house. Again, great 360 degree view, but not the highest. Remember uh, the Gosport Church is the highest. It's a great spot to have lunch in or uh, just a bird watch. Now here we are looking at the uh, jetty that goes from Star Island um, over towards Appledore and Smutty Nose. And they do not allow anybody to walk across this jetty because it is quite dangerous and you wouldn't want to fall. So this helps create um, the little harbor area that you have there. And of course, people are always very interested in what's happening um, on the other side. So it looks like our boat is coming. So this is the, uh, the steamship, the Thomas Layton, who is going to be coming to get us and bring us back to Portsmouth. Um, the Thomas Layton uh, was uh, originally built with a water tank that was designed to bring drinking water out to the Isles of Shoals. And um, the design of the Thomas Layton is, uh, you know, very similar to the steamboats that you would have seen coming out here um, back in the late 19th century. And um, it's just uh, really just such an amazing feeling to, you know, step off the island and onto the Thomas Layton and you, you sort of feel a renewal of spirit when you're on um, Star Island. And, you know, right away, uh, people that are down on the docks will, um, will often tell you that, you know, you will be back on Star Island. And there was uh, a tradition of singing the guests away as well. Pelicans would be down there and singing to the guests. And it's just um, it's just such a, an amazing sort of goodbye ritual. So as we climb um, aboard the Thomas Layton and you know, sort of uh, look back here from the, the float that's in front of us, sort of contemplating um, not wanting to leave because it is just uh, such an amazing place. Looking out our view here, back to the island. And again, finding a seat somewhere on the Thomas Layton so we can get the, the best view as we start to make our way. So as we start to make our way from the island, one of the things that I always um, contemplate is, you know, what we're floating over. And you know, New England is home to over 5,400 known shipwrecks, many of them being out on the Isles of Shoals. One of the first shipwreck stories that I had read about related to these men that had wrecked in the um, early 1700s out on the islands. And it appeared as though these big um, pieces of ship or these big pieces of wood that were floating out there had men that, that had just been holding on, hoping to be rescued. And uh, according to the story, when those pieces of wood were pulled in with these men that were on them, you know, essentially clinging to these rafts, uh, they had actually frozen to death and had frozen right to the rafts that they had put together. So there's um, a lot of very dramatic stories of shipwrecks um, out along the Isles of Shoals and, and you know, also Star Island as well. 
So I always wonder, you know, if there's any sort of uh, remnant underneath us or, uh, you know, floating in the water there. And indeed, um, there are quite a lot of things. Um, so these are some of the items that had washed um, out to the great island of Newcastle, which we had passed on our way out. And um, just as, you know, a, a little aside, if you ever want to go to the uh, Historical Society Museum in Newcastle, you're going to find all sorts of artifacts that have been pulled up over the years. And I mean, caseloads of artifacts. Um, you'll see sometimes these livestock bones uh, will be pulled out of uh, these, you know, the sand. Because when these ships went out, particularly imagine when they went out to Star Island, um, they had livestock on them. And when the ships went down, everything went with them. So there's all sorts of interesting things that you'll, um, you'll find, you know, again, around the aisles and as you start to make your way um, back to Portsmouth. So here we're coming up on um, Whaleback Lighthouse. We're cutting our hour long trip back from the Isles of Shoals um, down a little bit. Whaleback Lighthouse is a granite lighthouse and it is um, owned by the town of Kittery. And it's really designed as you're coming up to Portsmouth Harbor to uh, make your way away from this ledge that is here and make your way around Kittery Point. So here's a, a view of Whaleback Lighthouse from the Great Island Common with uh, one of the beautiful tall ships out there and a closer view of Whaleback. But you definitely want to make sure that you are avoiding Whaleback as you can see the ledge that's out there. So here we are looking out towards Whaleback. Um, way off in the distance would be the Isles of Shoals. Um, this image is from Fort Foster, which is located at Kittery Point. Here's a view of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse and Fort Constitution, formerly Fort William and Mary. As we make our way along the Piscataqua River, um, heading back to our dock, we're past the old Portsmouth Naval Prison. This was known as the Alcatraz of the East. So here we are making our way um, back into Portsmouth. There's a beautiful Moffat Lad House. And you can see that amazing horse chestnut tree to the left of that, which was planted in 1776. Um, at one time, this was home to William Whipple, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And when he came back from signing the Declaration, he planted that horse chestnut tree. The house can be toured. Um, it's absolutely amazing, as are the terrace gardens that are behind it. Quite a maze when um, I opened the photo album and I had this picture of Oscar Layton in, um, in it, this original picture of him um, out at Star Island. It was just really amazing. Um, he wrote this great book It's called 90 Years at the Isles of Shoals. And he talks about his life out there, particularly in the 19th century. He was um, an absolutely fascinating character. Um, and the book is also um, equally amazing. And he talks about all of um, the different people that he would see out on the islands, different things um, that had happened. Uh, he was also a poet. He wrote lots of poems about um, weather and, you know, again, some of his experiences out there. And um, it's just amazing, uh, again, that I found this picture um, in, in this uh, photo album. And he uh, wrote this little piece I wanted to uh, share with you um, before, we, uh, before we close. And he uh, talks about finding um, this shawl. Uh, out on a chair. And he wrote this piece, it's called Her Shawl. And he wrote, Dearest, where art thou? In the silent room, I find this wonder of some forgotten loom, thy silken shawl, whose lines of loveliness, the matchless beauty of thy form caress. Delicate raiment I share, I dare enfold all these warm kisses mid thy threads of gold. Oh, hold them close to her icy heart above, melting its winter into summer's love. Beneath her coldness fonder still I grow, as violets bloom along the edge of snow. Though my sad heart there drifts a hope divine, over seas storm sweat shall softer morning shine. So love may dawn for me while at thy feet, I wait and kiss thy garments hem my sweet. He was um, described by some accounts as a um, 
a summer love for many. Um, again, he was um, very gregarious, very fascinating. Um, and again, I, I, it's telling his story would bring us into um, a whole another hour of storytelling. We'll say fairly well to Oscar Layton 